Hello, good morning and good evening, depending on what part of the uh, universe you're in. My name is Max Tegmark, and I'm here with my co-conspirators from the Foundational Questions Institute to give you a really fun announcement of who has won a lot of money in our essay contest. Now, with, with us today here, we have, first of all, my FQXI co-founder, Anthony Aguirre. Hi, Anthony. Hi, that's me, Anthony. How is Santa Cruz today? Uh, Santa Cruz is beautiful as always. You can never complain about the weather when you're in California. It's a Hello. Good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Good, depending on what part of the uh, universe you're in. My name is Max Tegmark, and I'm here with my co-conspirators from the... Um, um, I am unfortunately hearing an echo of myself from... Give you a really fun announcement. Go. Has you one. Stop that, Brennan. Maybe that's... Okay, Brendan, you have done a heroic job in, in uh, the administration of this uh, essay contest. Do you want to say hello to the world? <laughs> Brendan is uh, being quiet, but he, that doesn't reduce his awesomeness in any way. Then we have with us Zia Morali, who those of you who uh, enjoy the fqxi.org website know as the, or don't know, as the reason the site is so awesome. How is London today, Zia? It's um, it's good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Just barely. Oh. Wonderful. And finally, we have soon to be revealed some exciting winners who don't yet know what, what exactly they have won. They have just been arm twisted to join this uh, call here. There is thirty-eight thousand dollars on the line. So, first of all. What is the Foundational Questions Institute? We are a philanthropically funded uh, nonprofit that is run by scientists for scientists to support exciting research around the world. And uh, one of the things we do is we run essay contests to stimulate people to come up with, with awesome ideas. And this particular essay contest is now coming up to a, a screen near you. Brennan, can you put it up? Is about positive visions of the future. So, of course, we all agree that it would be kind of a bummer if humanity went extinct and that we should probably aim a lot higher and try to make some more positive plans for our future. But it's actually quite shocking, I find, how when we go to the movies, almost all depictions of the future tend to be this topic. And if I have a student at MIT who comes in for career advice and all she can tell me about is all the ways she's thought about in which her life and her career might fail. That's a terrible strategy. Of course, you, what I want her to do is visualize success and think about good scenarios for where she wants to be in the future and how, what pitfalls she's going to avoid. And This is exactly the sort of strategy that we all want humanity to embark on as well. And that is exactly what the entrants in this essay contest have been encouraged to write essays about. And we're very grateful that we could pull this off thanks to the help of many people, thanks to Scientific American, our media partner, who really helped get the world word out on this. Thank you to our sponsors who made this possible, the Peter and Patricia Gruber Foundation, the John Templeton Foundation, and first and foremost, Jan Tallinn, who many of you watching this know as the founder of Skype. And uh, Anthony or Brendan, do you want to just tell us a little bit first how many essays did we get in this contest? 155. And the 152 of those are not on this call. <laughs> so we have the three luckiest ones of all. Uh, and I, I should we... also say that um, in addition to the... One of the really neat things about these contests is that the essays aren't just you know, put in and then some committees off in a secret room decides which ones are the best ones. That does happen, but that's only at the very end. Um, what happens before that is that they're all posted online where you can see them on the FQX website, and they're all up for discussion. So, so we had the 155 essays. We had 6,900 posts discussing those essays and 250,000 hits in people looking at them and making 5,100 evaluations upon which the the finalists for the essay contest were decided, and only those finalists really went to the the secret committee. Um, 
So it, it, it's really neat to go and look at the essays and also look at the huge amount of discussion and activity that there was after the essays were posted, where there really was, was kind of lots going on on this board where people kind of praised and attacked and defended all the different ideas that were put forth in them. Yeah, so the competition was extremely stiff. We were really psyched to get such a vast number from people all over the world, from inside academia, outside academia. And the panel that shows the winners had a very, very difficult job. First of all, there were two special prizes for $1,000 each. Do you want to tell us about them, Brandon? Yeah. Or Anthony? Sure. One of the... Uh... So the, the panel was empowered both to review the essays that were handed to it sort of by the community of people voting on them and, and rating them, but they're also empowered to look through the essays themselves and say, oh, this is a really cool one too. So, so they, they gave these special commendation prizes for the, for the uh, particular reason of liking these essays a lot. Um, so, so there was nothing more special to it than that. Um, and there were two of those that the, that the panel chose. One was by Lawrence Hitterdale called A Rope Over an Abyss. Can you make um, that shown, Brendan? And the second was uh, by Robin Hansen called Look Hard, Then Steer Slightly. And then, so where we're all headed now is going to the higher and higher prizes, after which we're going to have a really fun conversation with the winners about their essays and with you who are watching it out there, and we can tweet in and post in questions as well. Uh, going upwards, we have $1,000 prizes, four of them, four prizes, which were given to. Uh, so those were given in alphabetical order. Uh, Jonathan Dickow for recognizing the value of play, uh, to Tommaso Bolognese for humanity is much more than the sum of humans, to George Gans for the tip of the sphere, S sorry, the tip of the spear, a sphere having no tip whatsoever. Um, to Flavio Mercati for you turn or you die. Um, and to Georgina Perry for smooth sailor, smooth seas do not make good sailors. And well, now we will smoothly sail on up to the third prizes for two thousand dollars each, of which three were given, six were given out. Two. Yeah. There's an interesting story behind that. The uh, the panel was empowered to, you know, muck about a bit with the rules that we gave them, and they had such a hard time deciding between these third place winners um, and the fourth place winners that they just couldn't make up their mind and decided just give more third prizes rather than try to decide between the third and fourth prizes. So um, we tried to be flexible and, and we said fine to that. So we have a bunch of third place prizes. The first one being the Leverage and Centrality of Mind by Preston Estep and Alexander Hoekstra. Then Improving Science for a Better Future by Muhammad Khalil. Third was Back to the Future, Crowdsourcing Innovation by Rika Focusing Science Education. And Brent, Travis if you're trying to show these to the, the world, you need to press the mother button. Go on. <laughs> um, next, A Participatory Future of Humanity by Dean Rickles. Uh, then a cartography of the future, recovering utopia for the 21st century. Then enlightenment is not for the Buddha alone by Tejinder Singh. Um, and that's it for the third place prize. So we have enlightenment, utopia, uh, crowdsourcing, improving science, participating. And, and Okay, now that we have been uh, suitably enlightened here, we move on to the second and first prizes. There is still $20,000 left to hand out. And uh, we are very fortunate to have the three lucky people who are going to share this right here with us on the Hangout. So, without further ado, the first prize for $10,000 goes to... Dum, 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 dum. Drum roll, drum low, bro. Sabine Hossenfelder. Congratulations, Sabine. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's Thanks a so much. Uh... <laughs> Talk. So how does it feel to have won the essay contest? Yeah, it's awesomely cool, you know, after having made a third prize and having made a second. 
Yeah, finally got it. <laughs> so what are you going to do in the next essay contest? Uh, uh, zero, zero that means she needs to be a panelist <laughs> for the next one. <laughs> yeah, but there are, this is not all the happy news we have because we also have awarded $5,000 each to the following two people, to Daniel Dewey. Congratulations to $5,000. Hey, thank you. Really well done. Yay. Thanks. And uh, we also have $5,000 to Jens Niemeyer. Right, thank you. Congrats, guys. I, I loved your essays. They were really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are very honored that, that, to have such awesome essays in here. It's been re really a pleasure to read them, and it's very difficult for the panel to choose between the, such awesomeness. Now, we're going to celebrate this for the rest of the hour by talking about these awesome essays. So I'm going to hand over to you, Zia. Hi. Um, yeah, I just want to first of all congratulate the winners again, the three of them that we have here and of course all of the others who hopefully are watching wherever they are and heard their names being called out. And also thank you to all the readers and the other entrants who contributed questions on our forum, www.fqxi.org slash community. And um, you know they've been posting questions over the past 24 hours there and on Twitter and also over the course of the whole contest because we have these discussion forums that are open as soon as anybody posts an essay and lots of interesting points have been raised there. And so if we have time hopefully we can go through some of those points that you know other people have raised as well as questions of my own. So um, I guess the first thing to do is to just ask each of our panelists to very quickly just summarize you know what their essay said so um, maybe going alphabetically starting with um, Daniel can you tell us about your essay on crucial phenomena yeah sure thanks uh, so my essay is about what I call crucial phenomena which is a bit of a, a steal of a Nick Bostrom term crucial considerations which are um, considerations that might cause us to make a big course change if we were to think about them harder so crucial phenomena are empirical features of the world that figure strongly into how humanity's choices influence uh, the size of its future. So basically in the essay I argue that one of the most important things we could consider now is how to secure a large future in which we can create many good things. Um, and then argue briefly that there are a few kinds of phenomena that are especially important for how our choices determine the size of our future. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, it's not all that plausible that plate tectonics uh, will be a significant, uh, have a significant impact on, on how large humanity's long-term future is. But it is plausible that uh, something like cosmological expansion uh, w will have a more significant influence on how much stuff we can reach. Uh, so I end just by suggesting that since these things are so important to how large our future is and how much good stuff there is in it, it makes sense to study these things uh, systematically and to devote some of our best resources and some of our best uh, question-answering abilities uh, to these crucial phenomena. So can I just, um, before we sort of move on to, to the next one, can I just ask you, when you say how large our future is, do you mean um, how long humanity will survive or the quality of our future? Uh, so, yeah, really, it's uh, uh, the the two things that I ended up picking out were how long humanity survives, and how much matter and energy we end up uh, uh, having influence over in the future. So it does seem to me that quality of the future is very important. But if we put our descendants in a good position to be able to influence large amounts of stuff and to have great abundance at their disposal, then uh, uh, I think we can. Uh, we can hope that they will be at least as good as we are at ensuring that they have a good quality of life, that, that those will be decisions that they'll be well placed to make. So by size, I mostly mean the duration that we survive into the future and, and into colonizing space, and that we do actually spread. We don't just stay all of our days on Earth, but, but spread out throughout the universe. Okay, and so we'll come and talk a bit more um, about that in a bit more depth, but let's just um, touch base with the other 
winners and find out what um, what they wrote about. So, Sabine, if you want to tell us um, about your first prize winning essay. Um, yes, I will. So, first I have to say that I'm calling in today from Reykjavik. Um, and I think that, you know, if you sit on Iceland, your perspective on the relevance of plate tectonics might shift slightly. <laughs> So everybody here is talking about the possibility of the next volcano eruption. Right, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so about my essay, the, the main point that I um, made there is basically that to um, address the challenges that we are facing, we have to be able to react as a species as a whole to very complex and intricate global dynamics that is caused by our own interaction and uh, by our interaction with the environment and um, I think that our problems come about um, essentially because we cannot intuitively comprehend these relations that cause the problems and so we cannot react to them we can understand them intellectually. Um, that's what scientists and a lot of uh, policy advisors spend uh, their time on. Uh, but it takes a, a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And uh, most people just don't have this time. Um, and they have other things to do. We all have our own little tiny problems. So I think what, what we need to do to be able to um, react to these challenges is that we have to enable people to make important decisions um, intuitively and easily. So they have to be able to um, obtain the relevant information and they um, need to have it presented in a way that they um, can take it into account without having to do a lot of thinking, basically. So it's really about, um, I guess, a very kind of practical way of thinking of saying, yeah. okay, we may have these very abstract ideas and we may know how best to steer the future in, you know, a very kind of um, academic way, but how do we actually get people to implement that and to do it? Right. It's not, it's not happening basically because we are uh, dealing with an utopian human that doesn't exist. You know, the person who is totally interested in all that knowledge that we're gathering about the world and all the models that we're building and scientists are great and, and so on and so forth. But the average person just is not able to spend the time to actually gather all this information, make the decision based on it. So what I suggested in my essay that we need is what I call the priority map. Um, and that's basically um, a matchmaking between all this information that we are gathering. Um, that's already happening, so that's there. And on the other hand, the personal preferences that people have about what they want in their life and in their future. And what the priority map does is basically make this match um, between what, what the person wants um, and what the the models and the information predicts um, that they get, and that has to be presented in in a in a really simple way. There are various versions that one can think about uh, depending on what your technological status is. So that's that's the briefest summary, I guess, that I can do. <laughs> Okay, so I will come back and, and ask you more about, you know, how, how you're going to implement that because if you go to the site and read Sabine's um, essay, which you can do right now, you'll see that she has actually outlined a very nice five-step plan which sort of has kind of near-term aims and then uh, things that get a bit more futuristic to, tr to try and implement this. But we'll come back and talk about the details in a minute. So I guess on the one hand we had Daniel, who was talking about kind of crucial phenomena that can really change the course of, of humanity's future, and he's thinking about very big things like, um, you know, very catastrophic events. And we've got Sabine, who's talking in very practical terms about how, you know, everyday people can, you know, make changes based on the information given. And then we're also joined by Jens, who's written an essay that's coming at the problem from 
a third angle, which is to say, okay, we've got all this information. We've already got a wealth of information about humanity's past. Um, but how do we preserve that and store that for the future in case, you know, there is some kind of global catastrophe? So Jens, please, you know, tell us about your essay now. Sure. Uh, so I think I, I wanted to make one uh, rather simple and pragmatic point, and that is um, when you think about risks for humanity, uh, it's not only artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's also machine forgetting that we should worry about. And uh, in other words, when, when you uh, think about steering the future, it's, it's not only useful uh, to know where to go and how to get there, but also where we're coming from. And um, uh, so when, when we think about what is actually worth preserving for future generations, uh, of course there's, there's pieces of art and architecture, but uh, very much of the rest is actually information. So um, music, uh, text, or equations, and much of this information is digital. And uh, in the future, almost all of this will be digital, and therefore it's extremely vulnerable to, to any technological breakdowns or, or um, uh, global disasters. So the, the main point, really, that, that I wanted to make is that uh, it's, it's about time to think about creating uh, a repository of knowledge. And, and of course, you know, defining what that knowledge means is, is a great task and uh, a very ambitious program, um, which, which must be robust um, and which must be accessible. So, so I think the, the other um, big point that I'm, uh, or the theme that I'm playing with is that I think that information uh, should be accessible as a human right, and as the, defining what that essential information uh, that constitutes this human right is, um, is, is a task for humanity. Um, and so uh, I think there, there are three basic, you know, basically three key purposes for this repository. One is, you know, immediately it would be a great tool to have. For, for education and research already now. I mean, we, we have great tools already online with Wikipedia and, and uh, online courses, etc. So that would be complementary in a way. Um, but also, it, it would help you know, help us define uh, what we consider to be essential uh, information, essential knowledge that humanity wants to preserve for the future. And then, of course, finally, in the event of any global disaster, uh, this repository could have a sort of a bootstrap mode. So um, we must think about how to recover that information, that you know, the, uh, heritage of, of human uh, culture, uh, after you know, any type of, of global disaster. And, and that's a technological challenge. I think it's not undoable. It doesn't require any major scientific breakthroughs. It's something that we should think about starting now. It's, it's definitely you know, worth uh, starting at the moment, um, but it still requires a lot of thinking and research. So I think these, these are the main points. And I guess one thing that surprised me when I was reading your essay was it it's not that far-fetched an idea or it wouldn't take that much of a disaster to lose a whole load of information now that you've kind of you've mentioned that so much of it is digital I don't know if you have the figure to hand I actually don't but it, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't take much in terms of you know losing electricity for a short while to lose well, a tremendous bank or wealth of, of knowledge well, that we take yeah. you know given that knowledge is already distributed uh, globally in, in a very wide extent of course it would take uh, you know, a global scale disaster to wipe out much of that information. Um, but, you know, um, there is a certain probability that this is going to happen, and it's certainly going to happen over very long time scales. So, um, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about. I think Zia has a good point there, though, about the robustness. We don't know with any great confidence that nobody can write a computer virus which would actually actually erase half of Earth's hard drives, you know, and, and then in that case, there's probably a lot of stuff which isn't properly backed up. Well, I mean, much, much information is already stored on my USB stick, so, you know, um, of course you're right about everything that is connected, um, but, um, you know, absolutely, I mean, this, this drives the point home even more. 
Okay, so you're talking about these kind of global catastrophes, and that seems like a nice time to kind of go back to Daniel because he's been talking about, you know, actually doing research into these and assessing the risks uh, involved and what are these kind of big threats and, and even categorizing the type of risks that humanity could face. So perhaps, Daniel, now we can talk in a little bit more detail about, you know, what sort of areas you're advocating um, that people should be studying, perhaps that they're not thinking about at the moment, but they should be thinking about more seriously? Yeah, so the most concrete areas right now, I, I think something that, um, I think something that's interesting about these questions is that it's clear that our priorities will change over time, that at different times in human history, uh, it's appropriate to have different sorts of priorities about what you focus on. Um, so perhaps during the agricultural revolution, it was most appropriate to focus on this kind of like growth, figuring out how to uh, uh, harness nature in order to support more people. Uh, and maybe during the industrial revolution, it would have been more appropriate to think a little bit ahead about our environmental impact instead of waiting until much later. Um, so I think right now, the areas that um, that I would point to and that that people I work with would point to as valuable are these uh, technological extinction risks. It is it, it is looking a little bit on the on the risk and threat side, but it, it looks like where the action is right now. Um, so one example that's been getting a lot of actually really good attention paid to it lately are uh, uh, what I call biological instability, but what's more popularly called uh, potentially pandemic pathogens, mm -hmm. uh, especially biological engineering research. Uh, so there's this risk that this phenomenon that we don't know very much about, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the the ways that new organisms can emerge and be changed by biological engineering and then can have effects on biological systems like humans or the, the biosphere that we inhabit um, uh, that we don't really understand. So there are sort of two two situations I could imagine we could be in. We might be on a wide shelf. So imagine walking out on a beach and walking out into the surf and uh, the water continues to be shallow far out and you can sort of walk and play and, and be relatively safe. Uh, and we might be in that situation where no amount of biological engineering produces anything that's really that dangerous. Uh, but we might be in a situation where there's a, where there's a shelf and a drop off where the water is shallow and then all of a sudden it becomes quite deep. And uh, so I think right now we don't know quite which situation we're in with biological engineering, whether, whether we can do this research sort of with impunity and not worry too much, or whether we should really be mapping out that, uh, that drop-off point and that danger zone. Um, so I biological engineering, I think, is an interesting area to look at. And taking that example, who is we when we talk about, you know, we should be doing this research? Is it the, you know, the biological engineers, the biologists, the people that are putting this together? Should there be kind of a separate body of experts who are perhaps more objective or are looking at it from a different way, perhaps not as invested um, in the research? You know, who do we get to, to come in and oversee these risks? Yeah, so I think this is a challenge. One, uh, one thing that I would say is that since these are common good type problems, no one group is going to harvest most of the benefits. It's a, it's a collective good that we're producing. It does make sense for governments to be involved with this sort of situation. Um, I think mostly from a funding side. Uh, there, the, the, the thing you point out exactly with biological engineers have the most knowledge about this area, but they're also in a very challenging position where you, you don't want to undercut your colleagues and you don't want to you, you don't want to threaten your colleagues work uh, by raising these sorts of issues. Um, so I think we may actually need to figure out how to deal with these things and how to create the appropriate incentives within university systems and within government funding agencies to say, uh, look, there's a place for uh, uh, for questioning this kind of work, and the result won't be people losing their careers and people losing their jobs and, and people losing everything that they've worked so hard for. Um, so I think it's really important to tread lightly in this area, if that makes sense, uh, uh, to try to 
give people the opportunity to take strong responsibility for what their field is doing. Um, uh, but so the to answer your question more briefly, the we that I'm talking about is uh, uh, the government and the academic community, and to a slightly lesser extent, commercial researchers. Um, here's a, a point that was raised on the forum for your essay, and it you know it might be something you want to think about, and it also touches on um, the topic of Sabine's essay as well. This is from Georgina Parry. And she raised the point that, you know, she, she raised the example of GM crops and um, the example of organisms escaping right, from secure facilities and, and causing problems. And she said, well, look, in those cases, there was research done. People knew that there was a risk there. It's just people didn't do anything about it. They didn't act early enough. They weren't that bothered. And, um, you know, this sort of happened. So, you know, what's the balance there in terms of how much, you know, we know about this, you know, we know that there are problems, but how do we get people to listen and to care and to do something about it? And I'll also ask Sabine about that in a second too. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'm, I'm, I was really glad to see Sabine's essay show up here because I think getting people to act wisely in accordance with their values and in what's really their self-interest is a difficult problem. Um, uh, I think that we don't yet know very well how to do that. One thing we can do is develop cognitive tools. So for example, I think everyone has made a pro and con list when they're making a decision. Uh, this is a tool that's been really widely adopted uh, uh, by people when they're making big decisions, is to list all of the good things and list all of the bad things about each option and then weigh them up. Um, so there are things that can be done. For example, in the in the potentially pandemic pathogen community, uh, people are devising systems for uh, for doing uh, a risk analysis and a benefit analysis on biological research that's going to be done, and then deciding whether the proposal can be made more safe and then it'll be worth it, or whether the proposal is just too risky to proceed with. So I think creating those cognitive tools, and which is sort of what Sabine is talking about on a grander scale, creating those cognitive tools can be really valuable. Um, I'm glad people are doing it. Okay, so uh, Sabine, I guess it's time for you to, to take over because um, as we just talked about a little bit earlier, a large part of your essay was, you know, the point of your essay was to talk about how to get people to take these risks seriously. And I guess one of the, the major points that you made was that we can't just tell people this is for the greater good. They have to get some sense of why this is good for them. And you, you kind of gave the example of somebody, you know, going on a diet or trying to eat healthily and, and having to give themselves little rewards to keep them on that sort of healthy path to, um, to give them the incentive to keep going. And so how do you kind of extend that to, you know, these big issues like climate change and protecting the environment and, and all of these other things? I think you're slightly misinterpreting what, what point I made. So I did not try to make the point that we have to get people to take these risks seriously, but that they can accurately evaluate how much risk they want to take with right. the decisions that they make. I'm not trying to tell anybody they should do this or they should not do this or they no. should live more healthily or they should avoid, you know, I don't know, buying this kind of car or whatever. I just think that they need to know what are the consequences of their actions and that they need this information in, in a simple and, uh, as I said, intuitive way. And um, yes, um, a cognitive um, uh, tools is exactly the, the kind of thing that that I have in mind. Um, I mean, I'm what I'm. The, one example that I, I'm not entirely sure whether I used it in this essay or if I scraped it because I had to stay under the 11-page uh, limit was that I was thinking of giving people a possibility to um, convert the the match between a certain decisions that they make, like. Do I want to get involved into this campaign? Do I want to buy this food? Or do I want to buy this food or whatever? Into um, an image, like so, you you could look at uh, different options for your decisions, like you would look at different images in some um, museum or something, and just say I like this one best. Okay, so you would have to feed that tool first with your preferences for art 
you know, I don't know, I like these shapes, I, I like the impressionists, uh, I don't know what. And um, this application that I call the priority maps will basically um, produce an image that um, spells out how well a certain decision um, coincides with the preferences that you have. Like, for example, about, you know, um, you could you could ask people how important is it for you that your children will also see that kind of tree. You know, some, some people take this more seriously, others less so, depending on how they have, uh, how many children they have, and and how important it is for them to see trees. Some people are more city persons, and I'm not trying to dictate any of them. Like you should take this really seriously because I have two children and because I like trees, but it's their decision. I just want them to be able to to make an accurate judgment, as, as accurate as possible. So they, they need to have some way to um, aggregate all this information that is out there. So maybe if I was, um, you know, there's an upcoming election and I was trying to choose between uh, politicians to vote for, um, there might be some way of perhaps taking part in a survey or something where I can um, answer about what is important to me and on the basis of that kind of like some kind of dating online dating algorithm or something it would kind of match me with the person that I probably should think about voting for something like that yes, yes it's exactly like this um, except that it would be more applicable to general situations not just to this particular thing, and something like this actually exists. At least I know it exists in, in German, but it's very it's a very limited use. And there there are other singular examples where people have tried something like this. And my vision is basically that you get all of this together, so you only do it once. You know, you feed this in with um, your preferences about your uh, political preferences, your um, you know ideological preferences, your religious preferences, if you have any something like this, how important is science to me, you know, not, not everybody agrees on this. And uh, you collect all this information at some point, and then you, you do exactly that matchmaking um, that you're uh, talking about. For example, with some political candidate. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, one point that was raised, and I think this was raised on um, the forum for your essay, was that, you know, uh, and this was from George Gantz, who I think is another one of our uh, prize winners. Um, you know, he really liked the idea, but then he sort of said, you know, when, you, when we talk about um, collecting all this data and giving all this data over in terms of, uh, you know, filling in questionnaires and things, could that be misused? Because, you know, and this is something we're seeing all the time, you know, data is being collected without us knowing about it and people are harvesting it and they're using it for their own uh, purposes. Is that something we should be worried about? Should you be worried about? Uh, um, it is certainly something that one can worry about. Um, and, and there's a long discussion that one can have about um, why information has to be protected in some way. It's basically because our societies, you know, thrive on hiding information from others. So if you hide information from others, you have a certain advantage. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're all still competing with each other, and that's not going to change anytime soon. You could say the same thing about private people versus uh, corporations and so on. It's always having information is, is, is about power, uh, eventually. So and, and on that level, you can certainly worry about what's going to happen with this information. But that's nothing that has specifically to do with my proposal. That's a problem we are having anyway yeah. in, in many different areas. And yes, you have to find a way to deal with that. Um, and it will always be a, a pushback and a push forth um, between uh, tools to protect your information and uh, other people are trying to extract them. Uh, I think it's what the biologists call a co-evolution. Mm -hmm. It's it's like similar like the co-evolution that you have between the spammers and the spam filters, <laughs> you know the uh, the spammers are getting better and then the spam filters are getting better uh, and so on. Well, you're absolutely right. This isn't something that is you know particular to your um, uh, your essay. And so actually, let me um, take us over now to Jens because 
uh, you, you know, this also leads into the question of how do we go about building this um, repository of data? And one of the questions that came in specifically for you um, from Roberto Paro was, you know, what approach do we take when we're trying to collect this data? Do we get sort of experts who come in and decide, you know, what information is important and should be saved? Do we have a kind of Wikipedia approach, as you kind of um, gave as an example earlier, where, uh, you know, people are contributing what they think is important information? You know, could we um, just have some system that's automatically mining information from us and storing it? So what are the actual practical ways that we could go about, you know, setting up this kind of repository? Um, actually, all of these, I believe, are important. Um, that there are different aspects of the problem that, that can be addressed um, you know, best by different parties. Um, I think there are great technological challenges, like uh, the robustness of long-term uh, data archival and retrieval. Uh, also, I think um, you know, cr creating some uh, semi-autonomous uh, mechanism that could plug information from the internet uh, and decide on its relevance uh, is something that uh, is, is a great um, challenge in information theory. So, so this, is, this is not something that um, uh, is, is necessary for building the repository. It is just, um, you know, I believe, something that will be worked on uh, to some extent uh, anyway. But, but certainly there's, there's a great part of this which um, which is sort of a crowdsourcing uh, challenge, like uh, um, giving people an incentive to uh, decide and and um, vote on, you know, their, their favorite books, their favorite uh, textbooks, their favorite novels, uh, their favorite um, you know, uh, images, um, pieces of music, art, etc. Uh, and then finding a way to uh, store these over long times. This is certainly more of a bottom-up approach, uh, which which can be pursued in parallel. So I, I think, you know, all of these different approaches have their benefits, um, and uh, and and they could be tried in parallel and, and must be tried. I and again, maybe this is, you know, sort of similar to one of the questions that I asked Daniel about who should be, you know, overseeing risk in his case and, and the threat of various um, catastrophes. In this case, you know, who ideally, you know, how, how could we practically have something like this happen on a global scale? Um, are, are you asking about how to implement the a robust structure? Of, 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 so, um, so what I, what I outlined in the article is, is sort of a multi-layer structure. Uh, and, you know, perhaps the most important layer is the, the outside layer of, of you know, a highly redundant, very cheap uh, um, mass article like some um, uh, tablet, cheap tablet or ebook reader, which already contains a certain amount of information, but certainly not all of what we consider to be relevant information, but which could be distributed by the millions. and. Um, uh, of course, must be updated from time to time, but but um, it should be sort of uh, autonomous for a while and would uh, uh, survive at least you know, by pure numbers uh, most major uh, disasters. And and these devices could already contain some information on you know, how to how to build up agriculture or how to um, you know, how to read and write um, uh, basic. Uh, basic maths, etc., uh, languages, etc., etc. So I, I think that would be the outermost layer, um, and, and that's um, you know, so, something that technologically is already possible. It, it requires a certain amount of investment. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this is a silly question, but where do we where do we keep this information to keep it safe? Physically, where? Well, that, that, exactly what form the global catastrophe might take. Well, these you know, the, the, these these simple devices should just be distributed widely, and, and right. so there's a certain chance that you know if there are, if there are enough of those, um, some of them will survive. You know, um, uh, 
Well, if you have millions of them distributed around the globe, I believe that there, there's a certain chance that uh, some will be recovered after any type of war. You know, at least there's, there's a, a good chance of it. Uh, you can never guarantee success, but, but that would be the hope, that if you have you know, wide uh, redundancy on the outside, that this might be recovered. But then, of course, you, know, you, you also have to think about the inner more most layers, which would be you know, highly protected data centers, uh, which could run uh, independently for for months or even years. Um, and that's you know that's more expensive. This is something that uh, uh, certainly uh, must be organized on uh, a national or even international level. Um, and, um, Can I say something? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, since since you guys brought this up earlier, I think you should not focus too much on these huge existential uh, risks that there are, um, because I think it is much more likely that it will be, you know, that that there is a real risk that that it will be a slow decline. Um, the, the Germans have this funny comparison with the, with the frog that sits in the pot when the water is, is being heated and doesn't notice that it starts cooking. And I think it is much more likely that something like this is going to happen. You know, just just think about climate change for a moment. It's it's costly. We'll have to adapt to this one way or the other. That will put some strain on on um, our um, whole system, um, the economic system, the social system. Also, it's already happening. So we'll have to invest into this money, time, resources, and so on. And everything else is going to become more costly. Um, I think that's how it's going to happen, you know. It's just at some point you notice maybe I cannot afford having this internet connection anymore. Maybe I don't know anymore how to get access to, to that kind of information. And then you, at some point your hardware breaks down, you don't have the money to replace it. And um, suddenly you don't know how, how do I actually get on this information. Like if you know, if you have a music tape at home, what, what do you do with it? I mean, it, it, that's a trivial example. You know, you could still do it, but it takes a lot of effort. No, actually, thank you for bringing up that point because that actually does bring me to, I guess, my final question. Um, and you know, you may have questions for each other, but um, and this question came in from John Brodix Merriman. It was more of a comment than a question, but it it sort of deals with the same thing that Sabine was saying here. And I think it's probably addressed more to Max and to Anthony and maybe to Brendan, um, who can sort of talk about the scope of the whole contest and the entries they got in. Because he just made the comment that he was, you know, he was very interested that, you know, he, he really liked the winners. But nobody was really dealing with the kind of questions that, you know, I see if I look at the BBC News website today. And you know, and, and you know, there are issues about climate change. There might be issues about um, you know outbreaks of financial crises. Um, there are a lot of things that are very immediate, and we've been talking very much about um, big global catastrophes that can take some kind of dramatic form. Um, in terms of what you were hoping for when you asked, when you set the essay question. And in terms of the sort of the entries that you got in, were you surprised by what you saw? Did you expect people to be dealing with questions that were more immediate? Um, you know, talk a bit about the selection and also your thinking when you set up the question. Yeah, I can comment on that. I think we were very much hoping precisely for this, that people would not focus mainly on what dominates the evening news. We know from that we have these cognitive biases towards the immediate. You know, it sells much more newspapers if there's an article there about an American who was murdered in Iraq than if it's an article about 20,000 children who, who were nameless, who starved to death, who are in somewhere in Asia where we, we've never visited, right? And uh, we, it's precisely because of our, our psychological bias to focus on the immediate that, that, that we feel it's it's so valuable to actually take a step back and say, let's also look at the not so immediate, because even I mean, you argued, Sabine, that that uh, that really big existential risks, things that could cause humanity to go extinct or or at least severely transform our civilization, like an accidental nuclear war or 
uh, engineered pandemic or something going terribly wrong in, in the future with very advanced artificial intelligence, even if you feel that these things are fairly unlikely, even if you think that the chance of it happening in our lifetime is only 10% or even 1%, right? That's still a larger chance than the probability that uh, my house is going to burn down. But I still buy fire insurance. You know, why do I do that? It's because even though the probability is small, you know, the impact is so large that if I multiply together these two numbers, I get a pretty large expected impact that it's worth for me to buy an insurance policy. And, and the spirit of this context was very much this. We want to encourage humanity to buy an insurance policy on its own future and, and think, if we look up away from the immediate, are there some really big things in the future we should aim towards? Are there some really big pitfalls that we should avoid? Because even if even if the probability is small, you know, the, ex the average impact, expected impact is very large. Anthony, do you want to add or to that or subtract? Or? Yeah, I would. I might say a little something about how it relates to the Foundational Questions Institute, which has kind of been the driving force behind this. And it's kind of an interesting evolution because the the contest sort of started, well, one of the great things about sort of interacting with FQX and, and just being in the field that we're in is there are so many interesting dynamic people thinking about really big questions. Um, and, you you know, I think the, the common feeling about theoretical physicists who think about the universe and cosmology and so on is that is that they're you know very removed from real life concerns. They don't really care that much what's happening in the world. They're they're not really very practical minded and good at sort of getting things done. And there's a little bit of truth to that, I would say. Um, but there are also a lot of people in this community that that we're part of who who do care about what happens to the world, um, and that they although they're you know they're not a minds you know making new cars function better that. As you said, they, they bring a very different perspective of looking at, you know, the, the world as a whole, the universe as a whole, you know, the time scales that normal people that are living normal lives don't think about um, because they're not in touch with them, but are important in thinking about the future of humanity. So I, I think um, it was an interesting experiment in my mind in having the, the sort of people who have a very sort of wide perspective on things because of sort of just what they do to think about the more practical issues about what's good for the world and thinking about, you know, we're used to thinking about the universe and everything, but think about life, the universe, and everything to, to complete the trio. Um, so I've been, I've been very gratified to see, you know, that there's a, a significant segment of the people who, who we've interacted with over the years and who have been part of the, the foundational questions community who really enjoy and are passionate about thinking through the future with the same sort of sort of big picture, creative, out of the box thinking um, that they've brought to their more sort of abstract scientific research, um, and I'm also sort of hopeful that, and I think this has been the case for me even that in in connecting with these questions and and with this project, uh, kind of inspiring more people who have, who care about these things and have a capacity to think deeply about them to actually spend a little time and effort thinking about them um, rather than saying well this is bad and, and important but you know what am I going to do um, I, I do feel like uh, we have a lot of capacity to shape our future and as individuals we certainly exercise that capacity and, and as this sort of society we often we exercise it, but largely on autopilot, and spending a little time thinking about exactly how we want the future to go by people who enjoy thinking about big things and thinking at a sort of meta level, I think has been a really interesting exercise. Let me add to that also, since, since you, Anthony, uh, gave this nice summary of, of the Foundational Questions Institute and its role here, also about uh, the Future of Life Institute. So. Uh, Thanks to the generosity of Jan Tallinn, who funded this uh, much of this, this contest, Anthony and I and, uh, and a group of others have also founded um, futureoflife.org, the Future of Life Institute, which is 
focus specifically on on these very issues that Anthony uh, mentioned here. Anyone looking here is interested in the in the sort of the long term survival of humanity and where should we go and how, what can what can we do next along the lines of the essay contest? Is very welcome there, uh, and you can join. You can volunteer, and um, it's. Um, I feel that uh, it, it's really quite remarkable, you know, given that almost none of the seven plus billion people who live on this little spinning ball in space that we call Earth actually wants humanity to go extinct. How small a fraction of our resources and our attention we actually devote to this. Just to give one single example to make my point, I mean, there are more people on this planet who have heard of Justin Bieber than who have heard of, of Vasily Arkhipov. Even though out of these two guys, right, the one we should thank for us being able to have this Google Hangout today because we're all alive, because he single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis, was, and apologies Bieber fans, but <laughs> he was not... Canadian and, and uh, those are some pretty strange priorities which I think are best understood in fact in terms of Sabine's awesome essay you know we have these cognitive biases that lead us to not pay much attention to the fact that that guy is one of the most important people who've ever lived and um, so if these questions interest you again welcome to futureoflife.org and send us lots of ideas and suggestions for things You'd like us to do now. Um, we're very close to the end of the hour, so I'll give it back to you, Zia, for some. If you want to make some final closing remarks, and um, I just want to thank everyone for, I guess, persuading me that you know we're not all doomed, and there is a way that maybe humanity can survive. Because I was very worried when I got up this morning about that particular issue. Um, I want to apologize to Justin Bieber in case he's watching because, uh, well, no one there. And um, yeah, thank you all for, for listening, for joining in, for the people who sent questions. And please remember, all of these essays are still up and you can still discuss them on the website www.fqxi.org slash community. And there's a video contest that you have just about enough time to enter quickly now on the same site. And you certainly have time to vote for your favorite videos there, too. Wonderful. So can, thanks can again. Can I say so some much. final words? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to say thank you, guys, uh, first for, for this essay contest, which, as you can probably tell from my essay, has been is a topic that has been on my mind for a long time. So I did not just start thinking about this when when I saw the announcement, but also just for, for running um, FQXI um, as well as you do, because I, I know it's not always easy to keep an open mind towards unusual ideas, and, and you're doing a great job, I think, um, for the community certainly, but also for for humanity as a whole. Thank you so much for your, your kind words. And, and thank you again to all of you guys who helped organize this essay contest. Thanks to all of them, those who funded it. And thank you most of all to those of you who wrote all the awesome essays. Thank you. And as we fade out here for the day, uh, Brendan is going to play a short uh, video about the Foundational Questions Institute for those of you watching here who don't know what we're all about. So thank you. When I think of FQXI, I think of all the wonderful things it has done to enable scientists to look at foundational and difficult questions. Some of them are crazy. Some of them will probably have profound influence um, later on in the history of science. There's not many places out there that will actually let you ask these crazy questions and even give you money for it. So often in science we get stuck because people are bogged down in technicalities and they don't stand back and say, have we formulated the problem in the right way? What I really like and find refreshing about these meetings is uh, the willingness to say, we're thinking about the problem the wrong way. Uh, and so that's the way to push the boundaries of science. The FQXI conferences are fabulous. They're very intense, so we do a lot of panel work, there's a lot of discussion, um, but then there's also a lot of free time where people can mingle and exchange ideas and at this very conference I have made several connections with people and we have projects uh, in the works.
They bring together people from physics, but also from neuroscience, philosophy, complexity theory, biology. And they're all talking to each other in a really productive way. The last FQXI conference I was at, about the nature of time, I met people who were interested in fluctuations and changes in entropy up and down, and that gave a slightly new direction to my thinking, and I'm, I'm thinking more about the statistical, mechanical nature of things now than I ever was before, and I'm very hopeful that over the next few years I'll really be thinking about how fluctuations become real in the universe and the role that plays from cosmology to the origin of life. FQXI helped me meet people that I had never had contact with before. I work at a small college in New England, and it's very isolated from the larger community as a whole, and FQXI gave me the opportunity to meet people who are at the larger universities and who are interested in things that I'm interested in, which I don't get to do a lot. And you come to an FQXI conference, it's almost like a reunion. It's like you come to see the same people, you have built relationships with them in the past few conferences, so when you get to meet them again, you have the same kind of dynamics, and I think it is very, it, it feels like you're coming home. If you're a scientist and you want to positively impact the world outside of the work that you're doing, and you want to reach people, these are the kinds of things that you need to get involved in.